Reaction attacks are a type of attack that we have now seen for copase cryptography in the sloppy Alice example and also for isogeny based um, cryptography where it was these extra base points that are necessary to send across and where Alice cannot validate whether Bob sent them well, invalid or proper or properly generated and where Bob can um, slowly recover um, Alice's secret. Now in code-based cryptography the reaction attacks were only given the secret message. In isogeny-based cryptography it was giving the secret key and here we have another example um, where we can, we will show how to recover the secret key from reaction attacks. So let me remind you of pretty much the end of the first intro lecture where I'm showing that um, intro actually works. So there was a comment about, well, we have an issue that we're reducing modulo Q and we're also reducing modulo 3. And normally those things are not compatible. However, we're getting the correct decryption if this expression that is stated here for A, namely R times 3G plus F times M, is equal to A without the reduction modulo Q. So everything is computed in R, so we have these reductions modulo X to the N minus 1 but the reduction modulo Q doesn't kick in. So if we take this polynomial and put the coefficients between, well, on the lower end, minus Q over 2, on the higher end, plus Q over 2, normally with rounding, or if you have the power of 2 for the Q, which is typical for entry, you would exclude the lower bound and include the upper bound. Now, decryption works, so we're getting the correct value there, if and only if we're choosing the number of non-zero coefficients F and R to be small enough. G actually doesn't matter so much. Well, I mean, in this expression here, you could either choose G or R to be small, but you also want R to be small anyway, so well, we can have G arbitrary. And M is a message, well, you don't want to restrict what you can send, so M has to be permitting to have a high weight as well. Now, let's assume that the system is set up in a sound way so that this doesn't happen. So we have our Q large enough that decryption failures cannot happen. But can we maybe take this from a adversarial standpoint? So let's stare a little bit longer at this equation here. At this A equals, well, it's computed S times F times C mod Q in this ring R. And it also should be equal to R times 3G plus F times N. Now let's assume we're given some ciphertext that decrypts correctly and we can test this with a reaction attack. So reaction attack means we're sending a ciphertext and we're watching what the other parties say Bob is doing. So we're playing Alice, we're actually Eve, but we're seeing what Bob reacts and we're slowly trying to recover Bob's secret key from this. Now let's also give notations. So this A, this polynomial, well it's a degree at most n minus 1 polynomial typically has large coefficients, so we're, well, we're putting them in the interval between q minus 1 over 2 and q over 2, as I said before. So we're starting with computing a mod q, shifting the interval instead of going from, say, 0 to q, we're going from minus q over 2 to q over 2, so it's symmetric with respect to 0, taking into account that we don't want to have well, any ambiguities here. Now that comes an assumption. And this assumption may or may not be satisfied with the ciphertext, and we can't see that from the outside. But let's assume for the moment, for the variant of the slide which has lots of lots of overlays, let's assume that there's one single coefficient aj which is larger than all the other ai's, say in absolute value. And now I can say without loss of uh, generality, let's assume it's also absolute value without, I mean, then it's positive, so the absolute value is also the value. So then, um, in this condition, then, well, we know it's smaller than q over 2, but we don't know how close it is to q over 2. So now our attempt is, can we overflow this coefficient? Well, can we overflow a to begin with? And since aj is the largest coefficient, we'll have the best chance at overflowing a and aj. And overflowing means the decryption will fail. So we'll see that our victim, or Bob here, is not getting the right answer. This might be we're sending it something where, well, we know what the correct answer would be, or we have just seen how it reacts before and then just 
observe timings. And if there's a difference, we notice he has changed. Suddenly he is failing. So reaction attacks assume you get a true or false answer. Does it correct me? Decrypt correctly? Yes or no. You don't get the decryption. It's not an oracle in that sense. It just tells you, was it correctly decrypted? Yes or no. All right, so let's first tamper with C a little, because that's the one thing we can send to Bob. So let's send C prime, which is the same as C, except for it's larger by one. We want to overflow A, and well, C is the only thing we can play with, so let's see what happens when we add one to C. Now the way that the new A prime is computed, well, Bob will just take his secret polynomial F, multiply the incoming ciphertext by it, and then gets this expression. Now C is C prime is larger by one than C, and since got multiplied by f, we're getting that a prime is the same as a plus f. And so if we're now looking at all the coefficients here, so if we're looking at what happens to the ai that we had before, there's now also an fi going with it. So we're having ai x to the i normally, that's up here. And now we're getting also an fi. So when does this fail? Remember they had one large coefficient, or well, one largest coefficient, namely the aj. And now we've added one, well, we actually didn't add one, we add fi to it. So it also depends on what fi is. So this fails, we need two conditions. One is that aj was already the maximum it could possibly be. So it's q over 2. Anything larger will overflow. And then we require that the j coefficients of f is plus one. Remember that there are t coefficients of f which are plus one, t minus one coefficients of f which are minus one. So, well, it might be, it might not be. t is a lot smaller than n, so this can happen or it may not happen. Also, it may be that fj is minus one. Well, that we can test. For instance, if instead of sending c prime, which is c plus one, we send c prime, which is c minus 1, then that changes the plus f to minus f here and the plus fi to minus fi here. And so now, when does it overflow? It overflows again at that 1aj. Remember, everything else is smaller. That's what we stated here. It overflows at the 1aj if it was maximal and if we're actually adding one, so if j, f j was minus one. Okay, so I assume that you now understand how to add a. I had a one and minus one, so let's add, add x to it. So, okay, adding x to it means we're getting an extra f times x here. And then how to sort this in. So before we had a i f i, because, well, it was one times f, and now we're having times x. And we should remember that we're computing in R. So we have a rotation or a reduction modular x to the n minus 1. So here I can now write fi minus 1 where the indices are taken modular n. So if the i is 0, we're getting e plus 1, well, plus f0 on the x to the n minus 1. And everything else is just normal coefficients. All right, when does this fail? Now, again, looking at aj, so aj will now have not fj, but fj minus 1. And so, well, same as before, it fails if aj is maximal and if j minus 1, if fj minus 1 is plus 1. And, okay, you could do the minus 1 again. So let's generalize first to other powers of x. So if you have k the power of x coming in there, then it changes the index to i minus k here. Same as what we had now with x to the 0 first and then x to the 1. And again, indices are taken mod n. And then this fails, yes, if aj is q over 2. And if the coefficient that goes with fj, that was aj, which is now fj minus k, is plus 1. Okay. Now all of those continue to work if aj wasn't q over 2. So let's imagine we have tried all the powers. We've tried k from 0 till n minus 1. And we've tried it with minus 1 as a coefficient 
and we try to have plus one with the coefficient. And Bob just keeps getting back to us saying, yep, decrypts, what's the problem? I don't know why he keeps sending me the same message, but I'm totally okay meeting on Wednesday. Or whatever he said. Well, let's try to kick him out of his comfort zone. Let's add 2x to the k plus, uh, 2x to the k. It's not so large, but now, well, the 2 appears here, the 2 appears there, and so our aj, which is the largest of all the coefficients of a, can be one smaller. And again, the same condition, it has to match up with a positive uh, coefficient of f in that position. Now, we don't actually know exactly what this j is, but remember that x times f or x to the j times f is just as valid. So we don't actually need to know what j is as long as we get all the shifts right, as long as we get all the distances right. And so, well, let's assume that 2 is still too small. We can just pump up, we increase until we get some t here. Now it might be 3, 4, and so on. So then we want to have that this coefficient overflows for i equals j. And so that happens if aj is q over 2 minus t plus 1. And okay, since aj was positive, then that means t is at most q minus 1 over q over 2. And so, well, then we're getting here e plus 1. That one goes away. And okay, eventually we're getting this. So what we do, we try all k. So that means we're trying all possible shifts. None of them fails. Then we increase t by 1. So we've tried with 1 times x to the k for all k's, 2 times x to the k for all k's. At some point we hit a failure. Say we hit a failure at t. And then we can start shifting. So at that point we do no longer increase t. We've now found that this one overflows. And we had a valid shift here. And so then we just run once through all the different case and once through the same t, t times x to the k but with a minus sign in order to get all the negative coefficients. <laughs> and I realized that t was a really bad choice because I've just said that t coefficients which are plus one or minus one. So this t is just some number um, pick any letter that we haven't used yet. I guess L hasn't been used. So we have some L here, we have some L here, and then, well, we're increasing this L and we're getting L and minus L. So the full attack for this without the assumption is described uh, in a paper from 2000 by Jeffrey Hofstein and Joe Silverman. So those are two of the designers of the entry filter system. And after a paper on reaction attacks came out, came out by uh, Hall, Goldberg, and Schneier, they said, hey, <laughs> you can also do this on Entrue. Actually, here is how, showing this nice, explain, explainable, uh, simplified version, and then also an unconditional version, where you don't have to assume that there's only a single attack, a single largest coefficient, but you can actually deal with, well, multiple largest coefficients. Now, Entrue is not the only lattice based system. I'm explaining you this one because I think it's nicely mathematical and easy to grasp. But there is a flurry of other lattice based crypto systems. And Scott Plura wrote a nice overview paper, or a nice attack paper in 2016, to show how to attack some of the more recent ones. Well, with key share reuse means if Bob keeps using the same secret key so that we can, one message at a time, get some coefficients of it. Now, our crypto systems are a bit more interesting. Because in Entro, we know that the coefficients are 0 and plus or minus 1. In other crypto systems, you might encounter larger coefficients. So there is more to search through. But he shows that this extra generality doesn't actually help save the system. All right, that's all I wanted to tell you about lattices. There is a lot more out there. So read more papers, watch more talks. But that's it.